I think today is like the first time that I'm kind of telling this. She also sexually abused me. Uh, she would, um, at a very young age, maybe eight, ten, she would uh, touch me in an inappropriate, uh, sorry, inappropriate places. And she would sometimes um, ask me to come in odd hours and tell me to watch her masturbate. Um, and I have to look, a watch. How old were you um, I think I was eight or ten. And uh, I was so afraid to retaliate because I know if I retaliate, I would be um, beaten up. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Stigma, the show where we talk about things that no one really wants to talk about. The show where we share stories that no one really wants to listen to. But most importantly, the show that empowers the voices that needs to be heard. This is Stigma. And on this episode of Stigma, I have with me the lovely Kirutika Turairaja. Welcome, Kirutika, to the Taj Samudra. Hi, Arita. Um, thank you so much for agreeing to be on this show with me. Um, I have, I would say you're probably one of my very first friends uh, when I was, when we both were five years old. But I know that here we're not, we're not here to talk about our friendship. We are here to talk about you and your experiences and one particular aspect of your life um, is that you are an open and out lesbian woman. How has it been being an open lesbian in Sri Lanka? Uh, well, Arita, it has been challenging. Um, so I identify myself as a cisgender uh, lesbian woman. I come from Jaffna. Uh, I'm Tamil, I'm Hindu. So there's so many challenges, you know, uh, living in a country like Sri Lanka. Um, challenges like, you know, when I was in my teen, when I came out, you know, I used to wear clothes which were not the usual stereotype femme clothes sometimes. Uh, and when you go out on the roads, you kind of get, uh, you know, catcalled and they would say, ah, Nangi Mali. And then that ha that was like on a daily basis for Nangi me. Nangi Mali meaning like sister like brother. Sister brother or your boyish looking girl and all of that sort. And also there have been couple of men kind of, you know, creeping into my DMs asking, you know, you should, uh, you know, uh, have sex with me or you should still have not seen a, a penis in your life. Maybe that is why you are still a lesbian. Maybe that is your cure. Also, so men would actually write to you, send you unsolicited messages. Would you get dick pics? Yes, many like from. So I came out when I was 14 and I was exposed to the internet when I was like 21 or 22. Uh, and since then I was out and uh, I even got like a, a, a unsolicited picture of uh, one of a 14 year old uh, boy's uh, penis to my DMs uh, saying 14 that. 14 year old boy also messaged you yeah. sending you his penis yeah. asking you to have sex with him. Yeah just speak so that you will understand what real pleasure is like yeah absolutely. and several men do this to you oh yeah and then now i'm immune to it also did you ever world. feel threatened or scared at that time i was i was threatened because i was young you know homosexuality was something which was not spoken about a lot uh, among society or communities i didn't know what existed what kind of organizations existed i even didn't know whether what to call myself a lesbian or you know all of that stuff um, so at that time I was also thinking even if I were to go to the police station right or even if I want to get legal advice what do I say because at that time I knew thanks to the internet that there was a law uh, which was a 365 to 365a uh, and I was so scared to go to the police station thinking that, you know, this police policeman or woman would just take me inside and put me into jail and not, you know, uh, take into account about this hate speech that I am getting from uh, unknown men. So despite being a very clear victim of sexual harassment, unsolicited, um, nude pictures being sent to you, propositions for sex, you were still afraid to go to the police because you thought the police will, instead of focusing on the actual crime that's happened to you, will focus on your sexual orientation. 
absolutely and one specific incident is at that time when i was about 21 years I was dating this girl whose stepfather actually sent a couple of thugs to my house uh, where I was living in Kalpiti uh, and uh, um, they threatened me to rape me and kill me and uh, at that time even I, I called 911. Nobody came. It took 30 minutes for the police to come to my house and uh, mind you my house is near all of these politicians houses. And um, thank God at that time, my uh, one of my uncle was, uh, you know, the uh, mayor of Colombo and I had some security guards coming into my house and kind of, you know, uh, giving a little bit of uh, back support. And the next day morning, I got another call from the stepfather saying that, you know, I'm still going to rape you and kill you. And I dare you to go to the police station. And even then, and we had CCTV cameras with evidence that these thugs were banging on my gate. And I still didn't go to the police station only because I was so scared. What do I tell this policeman? Because court of, in the front of court of law, I am a criminal, right? I can't just say I'm a lesbian. That is why the stepfather, you know, called thugs and wanted to kill me or rape me or whatever. So, yeah. So you, act, you had thugs come to your house. Yes. You had people, men physically present there threatening to rape you, yes. corrective rape, because you were a lesbian yes. and no action could be taken against them. You were afraid. I was afraid because of that. And of course, my at that time, my aunt said, just leave it. We don't want trouble. And I'm like, OK, because I was at that time, I was 21 and I was very scared. How do those experiences shape you as a person? I mean, when you think of employment, your relationships with not just romantic relationships, but your relationships with family, with friends, um, you know, accessing public services. How has this affected you? Actually, I was so afraid to go to any government institutions, especially after that incident, uh, because I thought, okay, fine, everyone is going to see me as this, you know, lesbian or a criminal in, in, in front of them. So even getting an NIC is something that I feel very uh, skeptical about to go to the AG or the GS because I'm scared that they might just ask me, are you a man or a woman? And that, that question is always there. Uh, and because they always... you don't fit into what a woman should look like. Absolutely. Because but... you wear a shirt and trousers. And, and I have short, short hair. And always the GS would ask me, why don't you grow your hair? Uh, and there was this other GS who, uh, who, uh, who was a woman. Uh, she was like, you know, uh, and she was laughingly saying that. So Grandma Sevika was telling you to show your breasts? To, to wear clothes or attire which kind of, you know, uh, shows my breasts so that, you know, it shows that I'm a woman, a typical woman. So my mother tongue is Tamil. So being a Tamil, speaking in Sinhala, also trying to make them understand that, you know, I am a woman, you know, I need this NIC done or whatever documentation done was a bit challenging at that time when I was very young. Also going to the hospitals, you know, sometimes you get, you know, as women, um, you know, you do certain tests, um, you might get urine infection or you might just want to test for breast cancer, or cervical cancer, or anything of that sort. And the first question the doctor would ask is, are you married? Because they want to know whether you're pregnant or whether you're sexually active. Uh, and then I have to, so thank God that I have been with doctors or I have been consulting with doctors who are open-minded and I always have been saying that, you know, I am a lesbian and my partners are, has been with women and uh, they have been quite open about it. Are you, do you have other lesbian friends? I do. And is there been any instance where you have felt threatened to your life or your property because of the friendship you've had with another lesbian? Recently, I had an acquaintance who kind of, uh, who also identified herself, a young woman who identified herself as a lesbian who went through domestic violence. And I was referred to her as a mentor and to kind of give her some referral support, um, some legal aid. And uh, I was helping her for domestic violence, uh, which was perpetrated by her mother. And uh, what had happened was when I kind of pursued the whole uh, support uh, mechanism, with her, uh, what happened is the family kind of identified that Kritika Thure Raja was a lesbian 
and therefore the girl who I was helping uh, has some sort of sexual connection with uh, Kiru and Kiru is trying to kind of kidnap her and lure her for sexual favors and therefore the sexual orientation became a huge thing uh, whereas I actually wanted to help this uh, young girl for domestic violence which was totally different from you know my sexual orientation or her sexual orientation. But there is something it's so unfortunate but it is something which often happens to the members of the LGBT community they are completely incapacitated from doing anything because they're immediately only labeled as their sexual orientation. Does that frustrate you? It frustrates me, Arita, because for me, domestic violence hits home. I went through domestic violence from a small age. And this girl came to me to get help because of domestic violence. And suddenly her family, the police, everyone starts to call me, threaten me. Uh, they, the police came to my house, the CID came to my house. The, the father came to my house, the uncles came to my house. I don't know how they got my number, how they got my address. The and police they, came to your house the to, CID came to, my house. to threaten you? To they, you? Yes. So what happened was the second time the uncles came, they came with the CID and they spoke to my landlord and said that, uh, is there a girl who is short hair, this much tall, da 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 da. She's upstairs, I, we know she's there. We will come with a woman, a, a WPC, at about 10.30 in the night and we, we are going to arrest her, tell her that uh, we will be there. And this was told to my landlord, I was upstairs. And I was of course in touch with my lawyers. And why am I penalized uh, for something I was not, I, I didn't do anything wrong for or to, right? It's outrageous. You are trying to help a woman who is a victim of domestic violence, which has got nothing to do even with her sexual orientation. Mm -hmm. But the police is trying to arrest you because you are a lesbian. Absolutely. That is what's important to them, not the fact that there is another woman who is being physically abused and assaulted. The case was also, they said that I kind of forced her and I've kidnapped her and I'm, I have given refuge uh, uh, for her at my place and that was the issue here and so, so those are the few challenges that kind of you know frustrates me like here here I'm doing something which I really want to do because as I said it hits home domestic violence hits home I want to help people I want to help women and uh, young women and men who go through domestic violence uh, which is perpetrated by their parents or intimate partners but here, you know, the challenges are different and I had to get three, four lawyers to get involved to you know, take me out of it. So, so yes, those are challenges. You said, Kiritika, that domestic violence hits home and yeah. that you yourself have, <clears throat> have experienced this. Uh, can you tell me a bit more about that? Since the time I remember, maybe five, six, my mother uh, kind of... Um, uh, cause the domestic violence, uh, not only to me, but also to my father. It's very interesting knowing in Sri Lanka, when you say domestic violence, people think it's always the male counterpart who kind of causes the domestic violence and the victims are always the women. Uh, but in my case, it's the other way around. It was my mother. Um, and when I say domestic violence, it was emotional abuse, verbal abuse, um, physical abuse. And when I say physical abuse, it started from five, when I was five, and it continued till I was 16, 17. She would uh, <coughs> use knives uh, to cut me. Um, okay. Take your time. She would... Uh, <coughs> Excuse me. No, no, it's okay. Um, sorry, Arita. Um, so she would use knives to cut me. Um, she would um, use chili powder to um, kind of put on the open wounds while it's bleeding. And she would... Uh, <laughs> she would use um, hot iron. Um, to kind of, you know, um, 
use it on my skin to burn me. Um, she would just um, pull my, hold on to my hair, take me to the bathroom and just bang my head out to the commode. Um, and um, um, there, are, there have been times suddenly she gets into moods where she would just, you know, pinch my nipples for no reason when I was very young, maybe at the age of 10. I also had um, verbal abuse. She would always um, be um, negative about, by, about my body image uh, because I was a little bit, um, not overweight, but I was on the heavy side. She would say that I was ugly. I was, I looked evil. Mm -hmm. Nobody would look at me. I would never get married. Uh, surprise. Uh, married to a man um, and all of that and nobody would you know um, like me and all of that so that verbal abuse was there and uh, thank you so much um, and uh, <clears throat> see when you're small when you're a child uh, your nervous system has to be regulated right so when you're feeling angry or when you're crying or when you feel stressed out that regulation has to come from your mother. Your, you know, tuned mother would come and kind of, you know, make you feel better or uh, kind of address that. For me, I did not have that, unfortunately. So for me, whenever I felt anger, whenever she kind of abused me in whatever the context or whatever the ways, I understood that the anger is a threat to me. My own anger is a threat to me because I have to also survive with my mother because I was very young. I was not independent. So at a very small age, I matured very fast. And I also, my self-regulation in terms of emotions was a survival mechanism where I learned to suppress a lot of emotions. And I also took that uh, to my adult life, which was very unhealthy. Uh, so therefore, every time abuse was happening at home, I would try not to cry because the more I cried or the more I kind of react, uh, things would just, you know, get worse. Mm. When the abuse was happening, what did your father do? He also went through domestic violence. But whenever these things happened to me, he would um, either lock himself inside the room or he would just get out of the house. So he was just a bystander doing nothing. My mom's sisters did not know about the uh, sexual abuse. I did not tell anyone uh, till today. But about the violence, yes, they knew, but they, they didn't do anything about it. Why? Because they, sometimes they say they come from this hi-fi family. You shouldn't be saying these kind of things outside. Also, nobody's going to uh, believe you. Who's going to believe you if you tell that your mother is abusing you? They are going to laugh at you. They are going to tell that you have a mental problem. So they prioritize their reputation over your safety as a child. Absolutely. For them, that was more important. How did that make you feel? Defenseless, frustrated. I didn't know what to do. And I thought that was right. That was the right thing to do. So I also started to uh, kind of go according to that. And I also thought, OK, fine, I have to, you know, protect my status, the dignity and the reputation. And until 30 years, I was doing that, Aritha. How did you feel <clears throat> that your father was so absent in supporting you? As a child, did you want him to help you? Did you reach out to him to help you? Did you feel abandoned by him, even though he himself was a victim? As I told you, Aritha, I matured at a very young age. At that time itself, I empathized with my father. I thought he is also in a very vulnerable position. So I took that understanding that I shouldn't be bothering my father. And this Even was at the age of 10. So this 10-year-old child who needed protection from her parents, but yet you felt sorry for them for not protecting you. Yeah. How have you recovered from that? Or have you recovered? Um, it's a journey. Um, healing is difficult, Aritha, with all of that. Uh, you know, 18 years of trauma and, you know, such violence. Um, I have resorted to therapy. 
uh, when I was 18, I started to go, go for therapy and I um, started to kind of understand, unpack and try to understand uh, what needs to be done to heal and to move forward. There are things that I can't forget and I can't forgive. There are things that I can uh, forgive and move on. Um, and I have had fantastic um, friends who I now call family. Um, I think they are the pillar right now who have been with me throughout. And um, I think without these few friends I have, I wouldn't have been able to come out. And they're quite open about talking about these taboo topics about abuse, about domestic violence, about LGBTIQ issues, and anything of that sort, about abortion and all of that. So in that sense, I'm very lucky. I've got a really good support system in terms of friends, who I call family now. Um, that's how I am kind of coping up. Uh, I wouldn't say I'm 100% healed. It'll take some time, but... And that's the reality for many people in the LGBT community. Yeah is that many of us have been so let down and put down by our own families, our blood relatives, that we have formed our own families and kingships Absolutely. through friendships, Absolutely. which have deep, deep bonds. Do you have a relationship with your parents anymore? No, I have cut my relationship with both my parents. I'm the only child Arita, so I don't have any siblings to kind of, you know, fall onto or get support from. Um, I've cut my relationship with them um, and I think that is the best decision that I have had because I am not going to go back to that toxic relationship or environment. Um, and uh, since then I have been quite uh, happy. How about your aunts who did not come to your support? There was a time that I spoke to one of my aunt about this abuse. Um, she cried one day and that's about it. She forgot about it and then she acted as if nothing has happened. When you think of yourself now, Kiritika, you know, you have mostly healed. You are surrounded by incredible friends who support you and love you and have been on this journey of recovery with you. You're working, you're independent. When you think of yourself now, and when you look at who you were as a five-year-old girl, as a 10-year-old girl, 12, 13, suffering that kind of abuse, what would you go and tell her? What would you tell the 10-year-old yeah. Kiritika? I was not ready for that question. Uh, I don't know, Arita. Run? I would say run and vanish. Mm -hmm. But I think the the, the right thing to say is it is bad. I know that it is really bad that you're in a toxic relationship with your parents. But trust me, this too will pass. Um, you will have a safe home. In future, you will have a family who will love you, who will say all the right words, all the lovable words, kind words. You will be safe, you will not be afraid, and life will get better. Thank you so much, Kiritika. This has been very difficult, um, but a very powerful interview. Um, you have been very brave, and I'm thankful you shared this here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Arita, for having me and actually letting me talk about all of this. Thank you.